Okay, yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first meeting of the year. Um, we've got Tony Bartram coming up in a minute to talk about AMCOG developments. Um, before we do that, just to let you know, we've already got February organised, which will be Stefan Huber talking about CD and DVD burning. And then in March, we'll have Daryl, who will be talking about his 3D programming language and stuff. So that that be for March. Uh, I think that's all I've got to say for now. So now I'm going to hand over to Tony, who will tell us all about his AMCOG development process. Take it away, Tony. Thanks. I'll just uh, share my screen. Right, so my name is, uh, is Anthony Bartram, and uh, I've been doing AMCOG games, running AMCOG games for about five years or so, and released uh, around 12 titles for RiskOS, varying from puzzle games to 3D road games to, to space games to whatever other genre I could lay my hands on, which has been great fun. And RiskOS has been a, a great platform for me to be creative upon. Most people have a creative process. Um, I'm going to try and weave that through the talk and then end kind of up on, the, on that at the end, talking in more detail with uh, a few hacks hopefully, as they call them these days, or strategies, as they really are, to maybe try and help um, get being, being creative and, and, and making progress with things. So it seems appropriate to, to make up some time, given I didn't have much time to write this presentation, uh, to uh, talk about the things I've been up to in the last couple of years. Um, I'm also going to talk about what I'm working on at the moment. There's some RDSP updates that are mostly done. Um, and new games in development. And I've also, as I've wanted to for a long time, been using RiskOS to create something that I can relatively easily port elsewhere, then helping to attract more people to RiskOS, as uh, Retro is a big thing out there on the internet, um, and also just lets me take some of my stuff to a wider, a wider audience. Um, and that's led me on to marketing, which is, uh, is quite hard. I have a lot of respect for, for, for Tom, um, of uh, IDENT uh, and uh, anyone who engages in that. I'm a lot less naive than I was years ago when I thought, oh, good software will sell itself. You don't need to tell, you what, tell anyone about it. They'll just find it and it'll all work magically. I was quite wrong about that. Um, and then I was going to end up on what my creative process is and uh, how I get things done that I create. So in the last couple of years, this works. I've got, I've released uh, a puzzle game. This is a parallax scroller. Um, it's the idea is you get got sucked into an arcade machine. And this came out again of uh, lots of interest in, in, uh, in uh, RPGs on RiskOS and puzzle games. And I, I really wanted to have an excuse to do a castle puzzle game. And that's really what it is. You end up in, so you can play as, a, as a, either male or female. You can throw objects around and blow up bombs and and, uh, and uh, solve puzzles. And it's fairly friendly, uh, child-friendly particularly, as unlike Carl's request on the BBC Micro, it's uh, not fiddly and awkward to play. The reason being, I think, is Carl's request was a very small game. And this is a, is a bit bigger, fortunately. Then I decided I was going to um, rewrite Star Maze on the BBC Micro. That was also available on the Atari. I'm not sure if anyone remembers this. It's a two-dimensional flat maze that you fly around with a little triangle and shoot things and collect jewels. This is a 3D realization of that. Speaking about being creative, there's nothing, I think a lot of the games I find out on Steam and other platforms tend to be carbon copies of particular designs, whether it's you sitting in a, con, a cockpit and then engaging in space combat or whether it's a platformer, there's a lot of design patterns which are taken. And the graphics tend to follow particular forms as well in many instances. And I really didn't want to have another collection of, 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 uh, of triangles. I wanted to do something different. Um, so I got three bottles, stuck them together with three chopsticks, some Airfix kit and some spray, and built this thing um, in true uh, BBC science fiction style. Um, and I did other things as well, I'll come to that. But by having a, a different way of creating graphics, it helps it to stand out. And uh, I think that it stops you getting stuck. If you can think of a different way of doing things, it helps get you un unblocked in your creative process. Then I wanted to do a game for the Southwest show, and I thought I'd be cheeky and have a go at doing Repton or Boulder Dash, underwater Boulder Dash in this case. Um, I basically drew over the top of a di dry diving 
instruction video on how to swim to make this little character. Um, and that was fun. Uh, again, puzzle games are quite popular on Risk OS, and uh, I hadn't written one of the, this particular one. It has some different design features compared to a, a lot of them. The, the Diamonds Fall, for example, it's presented in sideways view. So that's what I have been up to. What am I going to be up to? What am I doing right now? Well, um, I, I was quite a long way through a computer game, which I've uh, shared information on called Hair Rush, which I've been developed. I've got all the graphics done. I've developed versions of this over the years. But um, when the pandemic hit, I thought I'll put that down for a minute and stop and think about what I'm doing and, um, and left that for a while. And then Vince did his talk covering things he'd developed on the BBC Micro and prototypes that he'd made. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. I've, um, I've got this thing I started writing four years ago. I always have actually multiple games in progress because when you're being creative, it helps to have brainstorm, have multiple ideas and multiple prototypes. But I usually come back to them eventually, but I've forgotten to come back to this one for four years. Um, so uh, this one is a, a, a sideways scroller, a bit like a spaceship flying through a, a cave, but I did it with a car instead. Um, it's not a tile library game. Um, tiles, I should mention, are where you break up the bits of the map, like you saw with the previous example, so-called Boulder Dash or Repton-like game. Uh, the walls and the rocks are tiles uh, in a map, and I decided I didn't want to do maps for this because I wanted to save some time. Um, so I decided to procedurally generate things, um, which is working out reasonably well. Uh, so I want to have a slightly different look. Now, as I mentioned before, I do mock-ups and prototypes. So I have a prototype of this thing. This is part mock-up, this screen I'm showing you, and part prototype. So I can see what things look like, make adjustments. The car was done in pencil or pen, I think, and then enhanced on the computer. Um, and the walls come out the same every single time off a seed, but they're generated using a sort of mad bit of nonlinear uh, maths, um, which seems to work reasonably well. I'm hopeful I should have that done relatively quickly. The key thing about it is I want it to be playable. Um, and as I had with Starmine recently, in my, uh, which I've actually been working on more, and I'll talk about that shortly this year, um, it takes, you have to refine the playability of something uh, and get the psychology right. So it's not either A, frustrating or B, dull. It has to make you feel good. I've also written um, a tracker into RDSP. So for those of you who don't know what RDSP is, that stands for RISC-OS Digital Signal Processor. And it is a uh, kind of virtual sound chip. It has 16 channels and can do different, um, as we call them, waveforms. Um, if you've ever seen a synthesizer, you can make um, like hollow sounds or bright sounds with it. And they'll either be triangles or squares. And you can shape the sounds by sort of smoothing them out and, and changing the shape of them. And this can play both audio samples and these digital sounds and create um, original sound effects. And it's, it's very powerful uh, because it's modeled after a number of synthesizers. It's all written using very, a very fast implementation using fixed point maths. I've been doing DSP for some years, but I thought, well, it'd be quite cool to make music with this. And it'd be nice to have a tracker on RiscOS. Now, when you're developing something, it's really important to, I think, develop incrementally. So the tracker will come out reading a text file in its first form. So you have a text file with some columns in it. A tracker is kind of like a table and you go through each row and the row will contain a note and it will play the note one after the other. So it's, um, that will appear first and the user interface will appear a bit later. Um, I, I'm sort of looking forward to getting on with that separately. The development kit is being updated. So this is, I use my, I have a kind of a, um, a mature process for developing games. I have lots of reusable code and elements that make it easy for me to write things. Um, and I sell that separately. That's available to buy through the Pling store that shows when we get back to them. Uh, it has uh, sound samples in it, graphics, uh, library routines, and example games. Um, and there'll be an update to that quite soon. I'll just draw a line under it and say that's enough and just deliver what I've got. And the RDSP manual, I've written about three versions of it. I just need to kind of pull that into one version and uh, send it out. As long as people find it understandable, 
because RDSP is quite powerful. It's I say it's a it's, it's a synthesizer, um, but it's when you understand how to make it do things, it's not too hard. But you need exam more examples and tutorials in there, which is what people have asked for. So in in lockdown, I, I thought, well, I'll have a go at uh, porting this game that I, I've written on Star. I, I've, Star Mine is a it's a three D space game. It looks visually interesting. I thought maybe it'd be good enough because. Um, I wanted to make something that would stand out. Coming from Risk OS, which is almost like this lovely village where everyone knows everybody, into the wider world on Windows and Linux, it's sort of like going to London and, and, and holding up a, a sign and saying, you know, notice me, I've got something interesting, uh, and everyone ignores you. Um, so if you have something a bit different to everybody else, then um, that helps, frankly. It's actually quite key from research, I found, that if you want to sell something, it has to look good and it has to stand out. So how do you do that? Well, there's many ways of doing it. Uh, but the approach that I just decided upon was to uh, abstract. The crucial thing in software, you should always abstract, be lazy, make it easy for yourself. Um, so uh, I've got this development kit. And on Windows and Linux, and also mobile, I have a different implementation inside the methods. So you've got a method for putting sprites on the screen or playing sounds. Um, in, the, uh, in, in this one I'm using on Windows, uh, it has a, a different implementation that makes it work. Um, so I then needed just a, a basic to, to use. Well, the App Game Kit, they're based in the UK. They're a very small company. They used to make Dart basic years ago. And um, so I like the footprint of their code on Windows. It's about five megabytes for a little basic player. On Linux, it's 10. On mobile, it's about 40. But it's pretty small. And uh, I downloaded Unity, which is an alternative product. And it's about a gigabyte. Um, and it was, it was, I don't know, it wasn't my mindset. I believe in things being reduced uh, like they are on RiskOS. Uh, simple, less is more. That's my, what I like. So this is a, a great little program. I would recommend checking it out. So I did. Um, I managed to get it to work, uh, which was which was fun. Has some of my three D engine there, some of theirs, um, to get the look that I wanted. Um, I beta tested it, and beta tester said this is a bit hard. It's like play. I don't know if you've seen Star Mine, but much like Star Maze was, you on RiskOS thrust in a particular direction. And just as in space, you know, in accordance with Newtonian physics, you carry on moving in that direction. Well, my beta testers on Windows couldn't cope with that. They basically bounced off the walls. It was like playing pinball, they said. So I thought, oh, OK, I've got to change this. So I, I put a bit of um, damping in there. So you can still fly around and uh, rotate and get momentum. And that's all good fun and actually really important. It doesn't feel good if you don't have some kind of drift. Um, it's probably important in car games as well to have a certain amount of drift and momentum. But you have some damping in it. I've extended it, put doors and keys. So it's a little bit like uh, people have compared it to a dungeon crawler. Um, I'd love to put that back into Risk OS. You've got power-ups in it. You've got like, hyperdrive energy. You've got new threats. And uh, I put some, some models in Blender into it, which maybe I could use uh, Derek or something to, uh, to incorporate that. And I want to put texture mapping into it, ideally. Um, so I might get to that. But I will definitely port the improvements back to Risco as far as I can this year. And that'll be available for people to play. Um, so the code, well, it's basic. So basically, um, it's uh, not that different. On the left, you will see BBC Basic uh, code for Starmine. On the right, you will see the HEK Basic. Some aspects of BBC Basic are an awful lot better. Um, because it's really very, very good implementation. And again, some aspects of the, the library cores you have available in the AGK are, are richer. Um, but I didn't have to change that much. Um, as you can see, I'm rotating points and drawing levels and things, projecting. So I'm doing some of my own 3D logic in there, which gives the game a distinctive look. Um, it looks like this, by the way. So we've got texture mapping on the walls. Uh, we're 720p now, so 1280 times 720. This is what I wanted. This is what I wanted to have on on RiskOS, and maybe I'll, I'll be brave and try it. My timescales tended to be quite short between shows. I developed Star Mine between July 2019 and about October 2019, over about three months. So I didn't want to take too many risks with changing 
the profile of, of the application. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, it's, uh, that's what it looks like. You've got your laser grid, it's got more detail than the stars. It's now 16 million colors on there. And I've got textures on the walls. That little asteroid, by the way, is a rock from my garden. I think it might be a bit of a patio slab. Anyway, it looks an awful lot better than any of the purely CGI ones I've seen. It has a lot of surfaces. Uh, Star Maze is on the left. Uh, this is what um, you had in the BBC Micro, which is one of my favorite little games of years ago. I had great fun in reimagining the spinner which is this sort of yellow, red, and white cross at the bottom, and building out a foam board with a bit of my daughter's poster paint, a spinner, which I then photographed and animated in the game. I, I think it has shadows on there and lighting and various things. I stuck some bits of air kit, fix kit, on, kit on it in, in the best tradition of model making. So that's how I ported Star Mine. It's out there on Steam, getting a lot of attention, some good reviews. So that's positive, and more people finding out about Risk OS. It's on the front splash screen. Um, and uh, that it was using a logo that I have permission to use from, from Tom Williamson. So marketing experiences. This has been, a, I think, a lot of programmers and developers, it's all very well creating something, um, but then you've got to tell people about it. And uh, then a lot of people don't bother, which is why various companies over the years thinking of a couple and various products you know didn't maybe do as well as they could have as well as they could have done because they didn't tell people they didn't sell the idea so it is hard and i naively thought i didn't have to i think recommendation is the key if people tell you something's good that you trust and you see a review you see something being used um and and talked about like Tom's been doing with, with his risk OS Direct videos and things like that, people get a lot more confidence and more, more comfortable with, with things. It's not very good just to put advertising everywhere for people that frankly don't care. If I see advertising for certain products I won't mention um, online, I, I get quite cross after a while and don't want to use them because they're, they're too present. There's too much of it. As I mentioned before, you have to stand out and offer something different. It's no good just being, say, another Unix. It's no good just being another platform or, or whatever it is you want to sell, or a song with the standard melody or a book with the standard theme. It has to stand out. It has to look different. It has to be interesting. Um, it has to be a story to tell about it, even if it's not the most beautiful thing in the world. It's interesting, which I have to emphasize should not be something truly strange, because if you created a really original game design, for example, you know, blob meets blob, you know, or whatever, um, frankly, no one might necessarily care or, or, or understand what the point's in it. So you have to be able to link it back to something you know. In the case of Brisk OS, I connected it with the BBC Micro and those older systems and evolution of that. And I found that was really cool. Uh, I had all that power, um, as no doubt the other people have, have done. Um, in the case of uh, Starmine, people connected it with Descent. So this is a, it, my game isn't like Descent, I should say for legal reasons. Um, Descent, you can descend down a three-dimensional maze structure. My maze is flat. Not, not 3D in that, in that way. But you can go up and go down to the bottom of the floor and, uh, and, and the top and uh, fly around in, in full 3D motion. Um, and that's a bit unusual. Um, there aren't, isn't really any other game I know about that has that particular evolution of an old 2D game concept, which there were about three versions of that I found over the years, all a bit different. Uh, recommendations are important. So I've just grabbed a few random ones. There is a thing to spot on the bottom one there, which is cheating. I found that you can, on certain indie game sites, write articles and submit them, and that's perfectly allowed. They review them, see if it's fair. That's what I'm doing at the minute about how to do certain things. Um, people read it, but they'll also find out about my projects in the process. There's the indie game development database, Twitter. I found really effective at reaching people and reaching an audience. And yes, recommendations, really. Um, that is the key. If people you trust tell you that something's cool, then you think, okay, you know, Dan TDM or somebody says it's cool, I shall go and check it out. So creative process. I've alluded to a few things here. I've got a few hacks. I'm typically doing two or three games a year. And I'm not 
doing it all the time, but I can get through quite a lot. So how do I how do I do that? Um, now, I think this is really important. Uh, children are really good at this, and adults less so. I've been to a number of courses where they where they talk about this over the years. You do, a lot of people edit early on. So say you're writing a song, you say oh, that's not spelt correctly. You know that sentence doesn't make sense. What a silly idea. You know who don't don't do that. Just sketch it. Um, let, let you have to try to. Uh, it's like improvisation. You have to effectively sort of write or say the first thing that comes into your head. As long as you're on your own, you should be relatively safe. Uh, if you do that, key thing to remember is no di no idea is uh, is incorrect. Um, there isn't um, uh, you know uh, a, a a silly idea at this point. You can decide that later. Um, so experiment, sketch, doodle. Um, so I've got notebooks going back to when I was 12. I've lost some over the years, obviously, but, uh, you know, and it has drawings and designs in it. Um, and I do it now. Uh, so naturally from that, you tend to create multiple concepts in parallel. You could develop um, and you build up a collection of ideas. Uh, and then you have, suddenly have lots of options. Some of them might be really easy to write. Some of them might be horrendously impossible. You can never finish, but it doesn't matter. Maybe you're thinking of a way to do it. In the case of, say, Minecraft, they rely on crowdsourcing the uh, the designs. For example, that's written by one person whose graphics are somewhat primitive, for example. Um, I think it's important to avoid repeating the same pattern. That's really easy. And I, I felt I was maybe getting into that trap a little tiny bit. Um, it's important to pay attention to what people are interested in. But I think you have to do a bit what you want as well. You have It should be fun, ultimately. It should be interesting. Otherwise, ultimately, if your heart isn't in it, People will tell that, that if you don't believe in it, why should they? Um, but it's important to listen to people, uh, maybe find some common ground. Again, um, if you repeat things, uh, automate it. Don't waste time, on, I think, on the details. I've noticed a lot of the time people get stuck on some intrinsic detail about something they're making, and they'll have a lovely demo, but it will never progress beyond a demo. It will be stuck because they are um, constantly focusing on something they could perhaps automate or, or move away from. It's important to not, again, in terms of detail, to abstract, put layers behind you, sorry, in front of you rather, of um, uh, the thing you're making so you can express your intent. You don't want to get lost in the detail of how to write something. You just encapsulate that away, express your intent, all you want to do, then write in the software. It's simple. I mean, anyone who's seen the AMCOG development kit uh, Sparky demo knows it's about 80 lines, most of which are comments. Um, and it's, it's, all the code is hidden away in the library. I'm using text-based maps. Um, and some people use sprites for their for their games. This is like you know where the corridors are in the maze or where the objects are. The advantage in using text is it's really really low tech and really simple. Um, and uh, I can do such things as object starting positions or, or enemy starting positions really easily. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, I think being lazy is uh, is actually quite in this case quite a good thing. Um, you know, don't sit there uh, turning a handle. Get the computer to do the work for you. Ultimately, that's what they're for. But yeah, if you don't abstract and simplify uh, and you don't automate, you can get really stuck uh, and not make very much progress at all. So taking a look at uh, Scuba Hunter, most recent one. Uh, on the left, this is the, a game level, uh, which is done in text. And um, uh, the asterisks of these little blocks, uh, the, those things there, the at size of the boulders, uh, tease of the treasures. Uh, that's the diving bell. I think that's probably an octopus but, oh, shark down there. And it's just basically like a substitution. Um, and then it's just smoothly animated on screen. So uh, I think another thing people say is, well, how do you get any time to do this? You've got a full-time job, you know, family and so on. Well, the answer is, is that you, and authors use this approach that, uh, for books. Uh, you can just block out a bit of time regularly to work on something and you'll make gradual progress. It might take a while, but you just need a, a regular hour or regular few hours. You say, oh, I won't watch TV right now. I'm just going to mess around and sketch and experiment and play. It doesn't have to be like work, you know. It, it can just be experimenting, like we said, with brainstorming. Um, 
or you could buy one of these. I've got one of them. It's an espresso maker. Um, I find it helps my concentration quite a lot. I'm probably a caffeine addict, whatever you call one of those people are, and I sometimes have it late at night, but um, I have a high caffeine tolerance, so that's good. Um, sometimes I work uh, long hours uh, late, late into the night, usually before a show uh, for London or somewhere in some state of abject panic, um, trying to finish the code and make it work, and I'll sleep for a few hours and go again. But I quite enjoy that. But then you don't have to do it that way. And when I worked on the novel, which is included with uh, Legends of Magic, an uh, sort of RPG type game, um, I wrote that over 18 months and I did about an hour, an hour a week or so, about a thousand words a day. So that's, that's roughly what I can do in an hour. Um, then delete them, some of those words the next day because um, some of them, you know, quite, that's the RDSP manual problem at the minute. I'm not quite sure if all that makes sense yet. Um, so yeah, so what I do is I have my brainstormed ideas, which are sketches, uh, some of it's inspired by research. I produce a mock-up, uh, usually in a, in a paint program these days, I used to do it on paper, sometimes might do it on paper. So I've got about three or four, maybe five or six different ideas at the minute for things that I can work on, some of them are more advanced, um, being done in parallel. It makes it more fun actually, because you don't get bored just working on one thing, you've got multiple things you can work on. Um, and yeah, I produce a, a, um, a simple proof of concept, some sort of rough prototype, which is all that's uh, spy mission, uh, Dr. Atom, the escape, whatever it's called, escape from the ice caves, Dr. Atom. Um, that, that's all that was for four years. Um, and I demo it to people to see how they react, see if they think it's any good, and see if I care about it anymore because I might have decided it's not a very good idea. Same with songs. I, I have my phone, I record some, some notes on a piano, listen to it back, show it to people and decide whether I'm going to record it properly. Or if it, you can tell whether something has not staying power, it's a bit dull after a while. So that's it's a good idea to, to have something, I think you might call it socializing an idea, but I'm not sure if that means something completely different. Um, anyway, sharing is good. Uh, and then I, I might make adjustments, throw it away, repeat the above steps. The key thing is, is you should never try to finish anything, um, really. Not, not finish in the sense of 100%, perfect, complete, done. That never really happens. Um, there's always something else you could, you could tweak, I think. Um, so if you seek too much perfection, then it's another way of failing, really. It's better to be lazy, to not try to finish things, um, oddly enough, paradoxically. Uh, that's actually a, a great way to, to get things done. So here we have some mock-ups. So please don't mock them too much. Um, I, you can mock this one. I did this when I was 12. There's a game on bbcmicro.co.uk um, called Time Run, which has been covered by a couple of YouTubers, which is, I think it's nice. I wrote when I was 15. And I did this when I was 12 as a design for it, amongst many other designs, all of which saw the light of day. Star Mine looked like this, originally on the left, and then it moved on. I uh, um, did a video or while on YouTube just to watch the cat things moving around to see how they worked. This is a very silly game uh, on the right here, but I've written it on the Amiga, BBC Micro and things. Um, there's another version of it down the bottom. Uh, and uh, I, I've got all the graphics done. They're quite funny and, you know, they look like a two-dimensional cartoon. This little um, yellow thing shimmers when it moves. But uh, yeah, it's not the tile library game. I'm just I think I want to leave that for a bit and and work out whether it's 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 funny, entertaining, or just you know a bit weird. Maybe I, sh I should adjust it and have another go. And this was, of course, uh, Escape from the Arcade, Legends of Magic. Should mention that the book talks about these these firestones, these shards of crystal with a burning flame within them. It sounds good good on the page. It looked nice on the cover actually, but when I tried to put it in the video game, it looked like dead fish lying around on the screen. Um, it's a bit unfortunate, so uh, I didn't do that in the end. But that's why, yeah, having a mock-up is, is a good idea. So um, I think, well, I've, I've obviously got things I can demonstrate, um, I should mention. I do hope you could hear me with that because my phone was turned off. Um, what do you think? Uh, should, should I, is it sacrilege to show what the, the Windows version of Starmine looks like? Uh, Windows plus Linux, I should mention. Uh, it's up to Brian, he's in charge. Yeah, I think, why not? Can, it may it, not... There's a comparison as well. <laughs> well, it, I want to bring some things back in, as I say, you know. Uh, but don't forget, it's an evolution, and it's the same code inside, as I could show you. 
I'll put it there as well. So I don't know what kind of frame rate we'll get. We might get about one frame every three minutes. So I apologize about that. So this is running in Steam. Um, and I don't know if you can hear any audio. Um, I've absolutely no idea. I have a sneaking suspicion it might be played in glorious silence. So we'll let this uh, start and um, see if it does or when it does. We may have to be patient. Oh, there we are. It was in the other window. So I don't know if you can hear anything or not. Yep, the sound's coming through. Oh, good. I'll show you the beginning and I'll show you a hard level. So what's the frame rate looking like, by the way? Well, it's okay. I mean, for our, for our online connection. And Zoom and that. That's good. Just go and get a power up over here. Here we go. And if I'm lucky, they, they, you actually can collect cargo from these things. Um, but as ever, when you want to demonstrate something, it's never there. There we are. It's a 3D object. I'll show you another one in a minute. I'm just going to blow up. By the way, uh, yeah, so if I just find the blow up key, there we go. And those sounds are recorded out of our DSP on Risk OS. So that those are real time generated by the synthesizer. Into your passcode. It's another subtle difference. So you've got. Um, things you can collect here, um, a 3D rendered object. This is a, quite a frightening level, um, I should mention. So some things that come along and blow me up in a minute. These are quite nice. I could put them in Risk OS fairly easily. All right, let's go and shoot things mindlessly. There's a few more things to collect. So we're going to get attacked by a blender object in a minute, hopefully. It's homing in on me at the moment. So you have to collect a key on this level, get through a door, get some hyperdrive energy, and try not to die. Um, speaking of dying, that this little thing here is a, made with a CD that's been cut up and then mapped onto a blender object, and it's quite unpleasant. It looks like a spiky egg. It's uh, quite pretty in its own way. It's quite good fun. You like mindlessly shooting things. So uh, I'll just I'll just die gently at the minute. It's always good to uh, to end on a bang, I think. But that's what it looks like, in principle. There we go. Um, I presume you're all familiar with it with the games and things that I have on Risk OS. Silence. Yeah, they don't look like that though. Well, they don't look that different. Because uh, that's that's the same code. So when Star Mine looks the same except for the texture mapping on the sides. Well, maybe because I'm running on a fast machine, that was looking like sort of full frame, 30 frames a second video. Oh no, it's actually Risk OS runs slightly faster on the frame rate. I cripple, I put okay. the frame rate at about 25 frames a second. Uh, on there because, um, or 30 maybe. On Risk OS, it's, it, it runs up to 48. But so it doesn't have the texture mapping and it only has 800 by 600. So uh, yeah, it doesn't look quite a, quite as good. I don't think I've got Star Mine on this one. Um, I had various other ones. But they start, actually, I want to say one thing on Risk OS that the game says runs slightly smoother because I've got full control of the system. And yeah, you know, Star Mine, Check out the video on, online. It it looks it doesn't look a million miles from that, um, but it, it obviously yeah, it's, it's SVGA. That's true. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't that much. That, that took me about a, a, a one day to get it looking 720p and just put in some texture mapping on. Um, it didn't take a lot. Um, okay, which one should I choose? One or not? Or not? You're in charge, Brian. <laughs> Go on, Brian. <laughs> Why are you putting me in charge? Uh, well, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I can choose if you prefer, if you can't choose. So well, put... Scuba, of course, is one we haven't seen at Rugal before. You haven't seen Escape from the Arcade either. No, that's true. Yeah. So we'll do that. I'll see if I can make this full screen. Um, full screen. And it warns you. 
or tells you how to get out of it, which is a control end, I believe. So, yes, this obviously is. Um, ooh, oh, yeah, that'll do that when it's calibrating. So, let's uh, start. It warns you not to play it because you get sucked into the game. And you can play either as Carol or Colin. Um, so I shall I shall play as uh, Carol, I think. So it's sort of like it's a it's like a puzzle type game. You don't want to hit these things. And that is obviously real time sound, but you can regenerate yourself and your energy. That's why I press the right key. It's very athletic. So the idea is you've been sucked into this arcade machine. Um, and you have to find a way out. That allows me to basically use things like giant fruits and uh, and, and have an unre unrealistic modes of motion, uh, have an excuse for it. You have various doors with the keys that are locked. This is very child friendly. I found like young children cope with this quite well. Um, and you can save your progress as you go. And there are multiple music tracks. Next one's quite nice. Let's try that. And uh, you can throw these sort of objects if I uh, jump up. That's a sort of lame, lame throw. But uh, yeah, I've got the key for the door. Okay. Not going to worry about su suffering minor damage. So, my, so Sophia, my daughter, drew this character and I adapted it to have a walk animation. So it's, uh, it's good fun. There's another key over here. You can stash these keys away and go and talk to the wizard and solve problems. It's quite therapeutic. <laughs> the next track especially so. It sounds quite sort of uh, meditative. But I was thinking of, um, I think they had uh, the Moonlight Sonata in, um, in one of the older games of this type and I, I wanted something restful. But yeah, you know, it's, it's quite good fun. So you can wander around and explore things. You don't have to worry about dying every three seconds like you do in Starmine, which, which may be more of your cup of tea. Um, so I just retrieve the key. I'll throw it away because I don't really want it anymore. I have a talk to this little bloke over here. So these are analog synthesizers you're listening to. So I have a chat to the wizard. And uh, you realize you've got something to do. It's quite a nice chat. I'll do uh, one, one more, one or two more things. Um, trying to remember where it is now. It's not that. So, not going to get the scroll, that would be far too easy. But um, you can get, without giving too much away about the puzzles, pick that up. Just carrying it on a shoulder there. Very well done. If you uh, throw this bomb at things, it'll blow a hole in it, and it lets you get a bit further. It's quite, you know, quite fun. RPCM is coping with it reasonably well, given it's running about three other things on this computer. It's uh, not the most powerful thing in the world. But yeah, you get the general idea. Carry the bomb over here. Down here. As far as you can see where she's going, actually, but there we are. Very strong. Looks like she's got a bomb for a head at the moment. <laughs> Indeed. I can put it away. I have to have it there. These, these traps aren't very friendly. Uh, there we go. So I put it back on the head again, and then we'll just throw it. And a hole in the wall there so you can get well, unplug anything there you can get um a bit further anyway so uh yeah you know it's quite good fun that is in a nutshell that one now scuba hunter you can still hear me can't you brian because i hit my microphone yeah oh right. god i haven't broken it that's good i give a shame um i have to press space so scuba hunter another puzzle game Usually runs a tiny bit faster than my pie. 
we were talking about uh, performance earlier, weren't we, Brian? Yeah. You've now got a lovely exploding shark here. If you die, it's fairly entertaining. You get the general idea about this game. So if I go and let this um, this octopus kill me, for no particular reason, he just sort of disappears <laughs> like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's essentially um, a collection of order-based puzzles. It's got original music, as you'd expect. So do things in the wrong order and you'll get stuck. For example... You now can't get out. Because there's a bit of mud on the other side. So it's that type of thing. I'll die again because it's entertaining. Again, you know, nice RDSP generated uh, real time waveforms and synthesis. And by the way, if anyone is interested in how it works, uh, the code's all open. I'm never going to hide it or charge for RDSP. So if you can understand something about DS audio DSP, then yeah, it's all in there. And uh, in one big function, because I haven't got any stack, which I've allocated either. It's a bit, it's a bit one of those sort of like dense, high performance pieces of code. So we've got you know, various things from Legends of Magic to Mop Tops to Protector for the actual game kit itself, etc. Um, it's all it's all there. Um, and uh, I can either talk around any of that or I take questions about anything I've talked about today. Does anyone want to jump in with some questions? So one thing, so the, the language you've used for the Windows version is just another form of basic, basically. Well, what this company is, is um, there's two guys who work for Europress. Europress made something called Amos years ago on the Amiga. And they went and did something a bit similar, but not the same for Windows, called Dark Basic. And um, the app game kit uh, is a cross-platform basic. They don't call it basic, but it is. Because <laughs> uh, it's using the Dark Basic language interpreter, and that's the code in, in front of me here. Um, I've got a little adapter, and I've got my tile library, which is, is pretty much the same as you have on, on, on RiskOS. OS. Um, so yeah, it's it's lovely, small, not very expensive, nice little thing. So it's not like Unity. Duplicated your your library of procedures and functions. Yes. So you can port the code across more easily because then it it's an abstraction layer. I couldn't. It would be really horrible if I didn't have that. You know, I have to be rewriting large swathes of code. Um, you'd always want to encapsulate. It's like having a hardware abstraction there, if you like. Well, it's the same thing. And that's what they have in their code. Their functions, like um, set sprite position and create sprite, they, uh, they are shimmed through to OpenGL or some variant thereof, I think. That's a slightly different name. So, yeah. I mean, it was fairly straightforward in principle. So, in principle, because the 3D is, is fun anyway. <laughs> And so I'm operating in a, I'm billboarding things and you've got cameras and lighting that gets a bit hairy. And then you've got the coordinate systems and marrying them up, which wasn't too hard. But I'm using wireframe that lasers on the bottom of wireframe, which I'm drawing, which gives it a particular look. It doesn't look right if you put sprites in there or, or, or a scale three dimensional object. You want to have um, something like a, a, a laser looks like a wireframe object. You can see it from miles away, you know? And that's, that's how that works. Yeah, that reminds me. Actually, Dark Basic was, uh, if I remember well, pretty uh, popular on the Amiga side. And I think I there are still uh, some copies available somewhere on eBay or something. Okay, so this is a, so this is a uh, was it the Dark Basic was, was a Windows thing, wasn't it? So it'd be, I don't think it was a, a, an Amiga version per se, right? Yeah, yeah, there was definitely a Windows version, that's for sure. Um, I, I remember for some reason there was something. Maybe I remember one. And then the other interesting thing is, is actually the, um, the author of Amos has now apparently started to work or is about to release or has released a version of Amos in uh, JavaScript or for web browsers. Oh, wow. That's quite cool. Yeah, it is interesting. I had no time whatsoever to have a look, right? So I don't know how it, you know, how it works, but that could be very, very... Um, it shouldn't be too hard. Yeah. Because... For, for the new browser that's coming up. Well, because indeed, so you could actually run it on a Riskus, couldn't you? <laughs> Effectively. In, in, in theory, yeah. In yes. theory, yeah. 
because in terms of the gearing on the performance, it, it would probably work reasonably well, as long as you know you, you're not getting hammered with uh, you've got a decent like graphics like implementation. For be fine, I should think. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It was always quite good fun um, back in the day. So. So, quick question. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought of maybe you already did, and I just don't know, so apologies if I'm to um, work on some um, game engine library for BBC Basic to release for, for um, people? Good question, really. I, I had actually came across some like pixel art I did like 27 years ago, and I thought, oh, I'll put that on a BBC micro game. That'd be quite cool for an RPG. Um, I wrote my own sprite editor years ago and things like that on there. And I, um, I could do, you know, it's uh, all, the, all the elements are there. It comes down to where I, where I prioritize it. So you, for example, want to have, you have uh, assembly code for doing sprites, you know, and you could just encapsulate that and wrap it up. And um, uh, a lot of the code actually I've written for the Risco S tile library would probably work uh, in principle. So you could then do that sort of thing in BBC Basic. So in principle, you could take parts of the AMCOG development kit and you, it would actually just work on, on the BBC Micro with a bit of adjustment, you know. So I take some a simple set of assembly code routines for certain things. So you wouldn't have to... Um, like for example, there's a, a method for drawing the screen based on the map you've loaded. So, you know, that's all really simple. You just do it as a text file. You say, here's what the graphics are I want to have for these symbols, as I was showing earlier. And it goes off and draws it. Well, on the BBC Micro, you're better off having that little bit of rendering done in assembly code. Um, and then the game, you know, would run a lot faster anyway, right? All those things would be abstracted away. So yeah, that'd be quite a fun thing to do. Maybe at some point, maybe at some point I'll do that. Good point. Didn't think of that. Any other thoughts, suggestions, questions, complaints? <laughs> it's a dangerous thing to ask, isn't it? That game you sold me a few years ago. <laughs> Which part do you enjoy more? The, um, the graphics side in terms of actually creating the graphics for the games or the coding part? Well, that's a good question. I think that I enjoy them both in different ways. Like I enjoy doing music a lot, you know. Um, they're, they're not dissimilar to each other in certain ways. All those things are, are kind of different representations of the, of the same process, oddly enough. You try and, in music, you've got kind of symmetries and mathematical elements to it. Uh, in graphics, you have symmetries and aesthetic properties as well, right? And how you compose an image. And in code, you're trying to compose something that's aesthetically appealing, but has uh, obviously um, rules it has to follow. Music has to follow. Well, huh, depending on what you like, uh, it, can, it can follow a set of conventions and rules. Um, and so does code. So I like them all in different ways. I think that's why I like computer game writing is because I can do all these different things together. I don't have to choose one, which I'm stuck with. So I, I like them all in different ways. I don't think I like one more than the other. If I wasn't doing coding, I think I'd miss it. If I wasn't doing graphics, I'd miss it and music as well. Is that, is that a fair answer? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I suppose then uh, the, the following question, which would be, um, is there any aspect to the whole process that you don't like or like less? <laughs> Well, it's odd, really. Um, I think the bit, in terms of going to a show, a bit I, I, I sort of am pleased I've done, but I don't like doing is making all the cases, <laughs> cutting them and sticking them all together because it takes time. And then ultimately testing the software is fun. It's a good way of knowing if the game is fun. But you, I really have to test it to death um, to be confident in it. And that can sometimes, some people then write a game, they never want to see it again as a result of that because they are truly fed up with it. Um, so I think probably testing something to death um, and sort of uh, physically organizing myself to go to a show, then forgetting something and driving back to get in and so on, probably that aspect of it. That's fun. If you check the chat, there's a couple of questions in there. Oh, really? Oh, gosh. I, I have not got the chat open. I have to go looking for the for the technical way of doing that. 
Uh, gold. Chat. Chat. Ah, okay, gosh. Let's, let's see if I scroll up. There appear to be a series of things. People like being lazy, yes. I wanted to sell that. It's very important. <laughs> uh, coffee, yeah. Coffee. Coffee. Um, cider, yeah, okay. I'm looking for the questions because obviously there's comments. Um, shouldn't be any sound effects in Star Mine. Horror film music. Well, I can have an alternative mode for you, Vince. I can always always add that in. Um, have you considered using BBC Basic for STL instead of SDK? Um, well, like, so it happens. Yeah, I used to. I had the educator hand, and uh, always open to things. But I could do mobile and um, and everything off one code base. So I have. I, I might look at it again. I did actually experiment with it. Um, I might look at that again. It's always good to try new things. Oh, curry, good. Um, is your RDSP tracker going to be going to look like Pro Tracker, Fast Tracker, Buzz Clones? I want to try and make it look familiar. Absolutely. I, I, I um, it in terms of the layout, it, in principle, is is kind of similar to what people are used to. The key difference is because RDSP is a synthesizer, you can generate sounds inside it. So, um, I'm I'm very likely to uh, be my current implementation is taking envelopes. So you could play a sample via an envelope. Um, I might have samples and envelopes that you could choose. Um, I might have to adjust that. Um, but I do want to make it familiar. How sophisticated is your RDSB audio engine? Quite a few v free VSTs and other platforms are powerful and free. Well, RDSP is quite sophisticated internally. It isn't just a clone of C sound or some standard algorithms. There's a couple of things that are worth noting. One, it is using a fixed point inside, so it's very fast. Uh, two, that actually changes the sound. It, it changes the character of it. Three, it has um, some, some unusual aspects, like the, the uh, got anding the waveforms together, like you can do on the SID chip, and you've got pulse noise. So it's something which is distinctive. I've written that kind of code before, something called Wavebox, which for instance was encountered before years ago. And um, yeah, it's, it's just different, it's, but it's, um, Really appropriate for for like uh, um, for for doing things in video games, music. Is it true Jason Tipica is going to integrate your IDSB code into his new audio module? He said on his talk when I was there that he would. He's been asked to do that by by Stefan um, Cloverleaf, and uh, I'm perfectly happy with that. I I want it to be in the OS. I'm, I'm quite happy to you know to, to not own it. You know just to give it. To the community, I think what it's there for. I want, I want it to enhance the operating system. Um, the same way that on Risk OS, I have all my code open and I, I'm able to play around with it. Um, so the games are sold, but you know you own the game after you've got it. And if you thought oh, I can take all the code out, some the code out of this game and make my own game with it, then that'll be fine with me. More stuff for Risk OS. Uh, RDSP. If someone turned that into something slightly different as an alternative thing because it was maybe they enhanced it maybe they brought some vst code in um then that would be fine as well but yeah it has a different character to your standard vsts and um because it's fixed point filter and uh, because it's modeled off some different things the pulse noise for example is something i don't see very often elsewhere um, it's usually just noise are there any sprite routines that you are use are useful games that you think should be added to the os Texture mapping would be fantastic, please. Um, uh, I think that um, I, I would like to have uh, um, uh, some, maybe some more transforms on the sprites. I have, there's a, one thing that's nice in AGK, I, I did a, an article and a game actually that used interpolation. So you upscaled images and, and made them look nice. Well, the risk OS routine for scaling doesn't do that, but uh, AGK does, um, and it could do fairly straightforwardly. And it, it would it would make some of the, the graphics are better when they scale up. So that would be good. I think I've covered the questions. Um, I'm trying to see if I missed any at the start. Uh, yes, I think someone said, oh, indeed, Vince. Yeah, right. There's someone I work with who said, this is in, in this company, that his, his uh, boss or his colleague used to write code like on a Friday, I'd be down the pub and then spend all Monday fixing it. 
um, but uh, apparently work for them. Uh, it helps you think naturally. It's brainstorming, isn't it? You free up your mind. Um, absolutely. Whatever works. I, I think I was drinking a bit of brandy. One or two other things were writing Legends of Magic, which probably helped. I, dream, I, I occasionally seem to dream game designs as well. I find it good to have a pen and paper by your pen. Some of them are quite reasonable. Some of them are not. But yeah, anything I've got like stories that way, but not, not games. No, I, I played a game called Are You Ready Human in my dream. And basically the Earth's been taken over by aliens. You can either play it by rising up to governor of the Earth by doing everything the aliens want, or you can become a rebel and, and, and fight back. And I thought that was fun. So I wrote that down. And hope to write that at some point and maybe i'll do it i'd like to do it to risk us in parallel with other platforms but i'm not gonna yeah risk risk os is intrinsic to my creative process it's fun it's not frustrating to me um so i'm sticking with it anyone any plans to port any games to risk us all the assets are freely available somebody else seems to be very good at doing this <clears throat> so I, I i know they're doing that <laughs> enthusiastically yeah. and uh and, and if, it, if it became the case that nobody was and people wanted me to, perhaps. But I really like creating something original. But uh, I wouldn't rule it out. Could you do a cross between an elite type game with Douglas Adams, Simon the Sorcerer? Sounds interesting. <laughs> Potentially. Twist of humor. Yeah, all those things are possible. I like one way to be creative is creating fusions between things. I've got a number of paintings, and that's part of the technique. You put these together in a novel way, and you're not in trouble. Um, do like Douglas Adams' humor quite a lot, and uh, Terry Pratchett, and so on. Um, maybe something for you, Vince. There, have a narrative narrative game with a bit of humor in it. But yeah, I, I would be quite up for that. Yeah, well, I, I might the best thing I've ever had in terms of a compliment was after I've written something on using it and someone said to me are you now or have you ever been douglas adams <laughs> there you are i definitely can see it i can i can see that best compliment ever yeah absolutely person to be compared with <coughs> yeah i had a go at writing things like that in the past i think douglas adams was a very reluctant writer he had to be like literally locked inside the house with i've had agents standing outside the door to get him to write at all he wasn't keen on the process um, but so when he did come up with stuff, it was it was brilliant, of course. Any other any other things? Or... Yes, Tony, I've got a question on RDP. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I spoke to you about four years ago on this same topic uh -huh. at um, the regression fair, I think, regression show up in, in Stratford. Yeah, I don't remember being there. I, I was um, I had a Raspberry Pi there, and I was using Sonic Pi, which was a well. Mm -hmm. I remember it. I remember that particular uh, meeting, yes. You just brought out RDSP at that point, and I took a copy of it and started using it. But um, I, I don't know, things happened, and I went different ways. I haven't used, I stopped using Sonic Pi, I stopped using RDSP until I bought um, a Pi 400 this year. I bought the Pi 400 intending to put risk off on it, but I thought before I did, I'd just have a look at where Raspbian has got to. And I got down a rabbit hole of Sonic Pi for two weeks. Um, it is. Uh, do you know, are you familiar with it? Yes, I am familiar with it in terms of. Was it based on C sound at the heart of it? I think if I looked it up once. Something called symmetry. Something behind it. Um, it, it, it is. It's live coding basically. It really, it's Ruby yeah. based on Ruby, oh. and you set some synths going. I mean, saws and whatevers, and then with some loops. And then you can change the code whilst it's playing. Um, it's truly amazing. I haven't made any great music yet, but it really is. Uh, it sounds like C sound is type thing, doesn't it? Scriptable, scriptable thing. It is, yes. You're, you're writing what appears to be a Ruby code um, and driving the synths and samples to make music with, with sort of beats and things. It's, uh, it's quite sophisticated. I just wondered if RDSP could be taken in that direction, it would need a, a live an interface rather. I mean, I assume it's just an engine at the moment, RDSP. RDSP, you can obviously use the sound of the envelope command and other commands to interact with it. And when the tracker becomes available, then that will give a way of sort of playing back music and the tracker format. But you can, you can, um, uh, you can make some adjustments to it, um, possibly could introduce others. 
like there are commands you could have other commands if we wanted to which will do transforms on the sound you know um, because the way it works is there's a sound interrupt it goes through does a few ticks in there generates some wave does a bit of processing pops it out the other side and then there's a series of states attached attached to all the channels where you can you know you have pitch and envelope stage state yeah. if you like and filter um state and so on and the envelope commands describing effectively a small program that derives what that uh that machine will produce because uh, it's doing a transform it's transforming a series of numbers into into audio this is basically um so you know it's possible to have a different like level of of interaction with that it does have some program interaction because i say i i've integrated it with sound envelope commands and there's a few others you can set the filter in real time i had a question for someone writing a game recently and they wanted to make things quieter further away so i said well you while that sounds playing you can call this other command and it will adjust it was a, i think it was a filter which i was asking to adjust um obviously there's also some effects algorithms in there which which you can turn on and off and map um some aspects of it are simplified compared to some of these other things and deliberately different partly because i don't want it to take over the whole system it's designed to run in the background so you can do other things um because it because it's all fixed point it has quite a high polyphony potentially um so the answer is it won't do exactly what that does um it does some of it and it could do more if you like would it, would it do live loops that's the main question what loops of what loops like, of... They're, called, they're called live loops basically you set something going and the, the script is up in front so, so you, you say beats per minute is 60 and then you set something going and it starts playing right and then you change beats per minute to 40 right and run it again and it layers your beats per minute 40 on top of the sound that's coming out from the still running beats per minute 60. So the only way you could do that at the minute, once the track is done, right? So you, I think you might be suggesting you have a sequence of sounds which you're doing. Um, you could probably do that at the minute, but it wouldn't be maybe as elegant. You'd be able to trigger a series of sounds. Um, the beats per minute part ties to the tracker, right? Which I'm right. currently still working on. But um, it doesn't matter. In basic, you have a program with a particular series of sounds triggered. You then record that off to a file, play the file back, and then do it again over the top. <laughs> so you could make it work. Um, because it's, I say it is programmable, but it's not got the same use cases behind it. So it's like, it, it yeah, it has some interaction, but um, there are constraints. So for example, you probably have a much more flexible envelope system on Sonic Pi, whereas I've got a restricted envelope model. I've yeah, got two it's envelopes. It's not a question of the, of the complexity. It's a question of the fact that it's interpreted. It's running an interpretive language. Well, it's basic, isn't it? I mean, RDSP yeah, is driven by basic. It should be okay. I mean, it, it seemed to me there's enough overlap to make it um, happen on risk loss. Well, it, it would work it, at the moment. You could you go off. Say, for example, you wanted to. I mean, I've got simple music in in the games, right? Um, uh, I did one in Boeing in Drag and Drop, for example, um, and it has a simple sort of simple generative little tune that runs off in the background. There's all the sounds are generated, so it fits in the type and listing. It's got bass and like strings and hi hats. And snare and so on all synthesized and that's all running a little program um now if you if you've also got a record feature in rdsp so if you wanted to record that and overdub which is what you're describing yeah. then you could do that it has got uh, i mean obviously you could also program it so you could use some of the available channels to run at one speed and run something at a different speed i integrated it with basic because i wanted to bring back the uh, sound envelope commands to do something much richer um and obviously you've got the uh, star commands which are available to it. The reason why I wanted to do a tracker is because trackers are quite fun. They're very accessible ways of making music. And uh, we haven't got one really. We've got Milky Tracker, which right. is a port. But the thing about RDSP, right? It's running in a sound interrupt. You can drag the window around, should be able to, and it'll be keep playing the track in the background. The window might stop updating when you drag it, but the music won't stop, right? So it seemed to be an easy way you see, with Wavebox, I wrote that's a, like a, a DAW, a digital audio workstation on Windows, and maybe at some point we'd have something like that on RiskOS. But um, is that worth it if we've already got it elsewhere? I remember what I said earlier about the secret source. I think you have to have something different that people will come to you and say, "I can't get this over here. You've got it. It's really cool." Yeah. And other people won't bother doing it because they say, "Well, you know, um, it goes against the spirit of what we are." In the case of Sonic Pi, for example, alternatives basically. But yeah, in principle, you can do that.
because it's basic integration. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look at it and see if I can make it uh, do something similar. Well, with the tracker might make it a touch easier because then you should be able to set BPMs and things. But yeah, it's yeah, it, it's. Uh, I wish you luck with that. That's fun. Anything else? You mentioned being able to record. Does that mean that if you if you create something in your tracker program, mm -hmm. you can then save that out as either a wave or better still an MP3? Well, you can send it out as a wave and then convert it as an MP3 elsewhere. It, yeah. yeah, so that's correct. So I added recording and play recording to to um, uh, RDSP a while ago. And uh, I'm using that, um, for example, to get the sounds into Starmine. Uh, but yeah, so you, then, um, yeah, absolutely. It's both for, it's intended to be a feature of the tracker as well. Actually, well, so, um, go on. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, so if, um, in terms of uh, if you could, if you had unlimited time, you could just push pause on all obligations and you could sit down and write the ultimate game, the, the one that you really, really would love to spend and do, but it would just take, years maybe what one would it be what what would you what would you code what would you create oh well, that's a really i i probably would do like a really big rpg type of thing the reason why I, the reason why i say that i personally don't particularly enjoy photo photo realistic like immersive games i, I like a little bit of abstraction uh, the thing about doing uh games like that they're great fun to have an interactive narrative um but the writing the content is, is very, very time consuming and coming up with the designs. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't bound by time, I could sit there and just write a really immersive, interesting space. And I'd make it multiplayer, I think. And so mm -hmm. it'd be my own take on that type of thing, I think. I think that would be, yeah, I think if I had no constraints, it would probably be, it would be either sci-fi or fantasy because, you know, I'm, that's, that's my kind of what I really like, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think, um, and I, I would do it um, at some at some level, uh, so it had like a, a, a cool maybe like multiple modes of play. Because I think I go back over my notes when I was twelve. I had different kinds of modes of play throughout the game, so I'd like to have multiple like multiple games in one really. So there's lots of variety to keep people interested. I love. I think that's that would be what I would do. So it's like a criticism that's leveled against me sometimes that you know there needs to be more content. Um, and um, I mean, sometimes there is plenty and sometimes I need to add more levels as I've been doing some of my, my games. So that, that's, I think that's what I do. I don't think I want to, um, I think really cool if I had an infinite amount of time uh, or large amount of time, I'd probably brainstorm something, try to do something really, really unusual, I think, but not weird in a scary way, but just try and come up with something original if I didn't have deadlines, really okay. original. I think the more time you've got, the less you can manage. Well, that's because I mentioned earlier that, it, yeah, this is more, you see, having, I haven't said this actually, an important part, I believe risk OS being useful is constraints drive creativity, having limits, and having rules means you start to be able to, it's interesting to point out, start to be able to make you deliver something because you, Star Mine was written the way it was because I couldn't do Blender objects partly and also wanted to be different. Um, so I did something different. If I had infinite time, yes, you might suddenly think, oh, brilliant. You start to design and draw and never actually deliver anything. Because it's just, right. you never, never you're right. get to the next stage, would you? No, I think that would likely happen. Much, we're getting into the Parkinson's law requirements. Oh, yes. Work expands to fill the time available. Yes, it does. It really does. Oh, yeah. Same with resources. And you have uh, Conway's law to do with code reflecting the structure of teams that wrote it. So you can't you can't divide infinity up, but if you could, you could say, well, the first half of infinity, I'll I'll do design. <laughs> um, but by by now, certainly several billion years have gone by. So how, how much? <laughs> that's right. How much time do you spend on that? Those cognitive streams, the brainstorming, and then the sort of planning before you actually sort of put hand to mouth and. I do. It's sort of, it's odd, but it's, I do a lot. I try and use my subconscious a lot. That's the key thing about stream of consciousness. You're trying to not, your conscious executive, your conscious mind tries to edit, make sense of the world and filter it. You're trying to turn that off largely and trying to, so it's almost 24 seven. I could be driving along a car and get a song lyric, or I can come up with a crazy idea and have to write it down. So I think it's probably 24 seven. In terms of game development, which you might be talking about the timescale that it runs, 
um, it's probably it's probably gonna probably several weeks. It's probably about a third of it if it's a three month development cycle, um, because that's hard to get right. You see, if you've got, I think the design is is actually quite hard to get correct. Writing is not too hard. I think Escape from the Arcade took four days to write the code, um, and it took a bit longer to do graphics, concepts, and design. Star Mind has taken a lot, quite a lot longer, because even though I developed it out of Island of the Undead, inside of it, the zombie game, um, the, fun, the, fit, the, the way the things all interact and move is different. So the mechanics are a little harder. Quick questions about the tools. Now that you, you know, kind of had this uh, experience on on Windows and obviously on on Windows. What do you think Riscos is, is uh, missing and what, if anything? Well, the only bit, the stuff that Dow's doing is the stuff that I, I think it, it's missing. Um, see, I'm very happy using Vi, for example. And um, the editor in the uh, app game kit is not a very flashy editor. It doesn't do a lot. I use Visual Studio at work. It's a lovely tool, but I'm quite happy with just having a pretty basic editor. I really like StrongEd personally. It's one of my favorite editors. And I, sometimes at work, I've been in the office and I wished I'd had it with me because it would actually make me a bit easier for me to work on. But uh, on RiskOS, the bit that I'm missing at the minute is, is the stuff that Daryl's working on, the 3D, uh, the 3D model uh, uh, projection. Um, I've got like some simple painters algorithm and, uh, you know, billboarding in there, which is, is functional and, and works, but it's, it's very simple stuff. And um, I thought at one point I was going to write texture mapping because it wasn't there. I know how to write it. I know what the implementation looks like. Um, but yeah, that's the bit I think that's missing at the moment. For me personally, um, I find RiskOS very easy to write on. I, I, I'm quite, I, I've had to do low level embedded stuff. So I've had like things plugged in over an RS-232 cable. Uh, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with, with, with not being able to see what I'm doing. And I have to do it at work even now with the stuff I work on at the minute. Can't always see what I'm doing. Can't always debug it. Personally, that's just me. Thanks. Any other ones? Have you thought of doing a mobile version of mop tops? <laughs> yes, I, yes I have. <laughs> so what I wanted to do, what well, I thought of doing is, is that because mop tops is a point and click game, it will be cross platform. So risk OS, Windows, Linux, Android and iOS. And it would naturally tend to, I have to go inside and do some work on it because mop tops was the last game I did before the game kit was written. So I have to retrofit game kit function, uh, the um, ankle development kit functions to it to make it easy to port. Because at the minute it'd be a bit harder. I did start work on that and put it down for that reason. Because it was too much, it was too much to, well, I don't know, I, I started writing another game, I think. So yeah, I will do that, I will do that at some point. I should add some more levels to mop tops, that's what I should do. Because um, some people have finished it. Um, some haven't, but some have. I should write more levels for all my games. Um, and I should really, I've got, I always have a certain amount of, what's it called, technical debt where you can go in and improve things. So I should spend some time doing that, really. Uh, Phantom. What's it say here? For the record, I turn off my visit off. Oh, okay, right. Oh, no, more mop tops. Yes, that would be a good name. Uh, but I might get in trouble from certain people. Plagiarism. Change the graphics, give them a haircut, and call them mop tops locked off. Yeah. Or lock tops. Lock tops rather than mop tops. Could do that. Could do a mop tops 3D, but maybe not. I've got so if you call it if you call it oh yes, more mop tops. I could. I've not got that one. <laughs> it's true, that's right, it's different. It's legally different. Obviously not a derivative work. Um yeah. Might might be safe. There were some odd lemmings games I bought for 10p, um mopped paintball lemmings actually. Oddly enough, you shoot paintballs at each other. I don't know. <laughs> Windows 98 version of the charity shop. My daughter liked it. Not going to do that. 
Help me with my one. What sort of game would... I mean, I'm doing this procedure generated theme because I've, we've not got shows at the minute. Um, what would... I, I used to often ask, what would you like me to write? Apart from the <coughs> Douglas Adam fusion that was mentioned. <laughs> Commandos. Commandos, which I could go back to the um, the Legends of Magic engine for. You mentioned that. Yeah, which is why I said it. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Because you didn't do the zombie game in it. I do. It does exist. It just was quite funny. Because <laughs> 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 sort of, I took the Legends of Magic graphic and I adapted and turned in green. <laughs> and I got them to infect each other. And they move really quickly. I don't know. It uh, um, does exist. Um, Tony, we, I may have misunderstood, and I probably did, but at the last um, Rugal meeting, we were discussing um, command line. Um, no, no, I, I didn't misunderstand. I, I th thought, I believe, I would be able to simply spawn processes and have an interaction, because you can do that. You have a core invocation. And I think that what Andrew was talking about was a console-like a uh, window handler with a prompt on it. So yeah, it, it all comes down to me getting time to do something, which I do eventually. It all goes into a big long list. And um, I like RDSP. I wrote RDSP in part in 2014 and released it in 2017. Um, so I, I will get back to that at some point. If you do, I'd, in the meantime, I've had a, a look and I, I've discovered this, there's a port of bash, or it's called bash. Um, which seems to work pretty well on Riscos. I said, I can't, make it, I can't make it work at the moment. The last time I ran it, it worked. Today, it won't even come up with a window, but it does give you a, a window with and all the bash commands, which, which work pretty well on Riscos. So that's probably the way forward rather than... Make, <laughs> rather well, than what I wanted to do was to take the um, uh, command window and just, you know, risk of a slight but just just tweak it a bit really because then you'd, be, you'd have more access to it i'm not sure if the other one will be running inside this linux subsystem which you've got which you you know it's, it's sort of shared libraries isn't it, which it you is, have, yes. and then you know so it would just be nice to be able to use the existing commands with a few tweaks it would so be nice like, uh, native i agree 90, 20, 80 20 you get 80 percent of the benefit but not having to just sort of like nip into a but it's good to have that there i was i think i've Play with that some time ago but it just yeah it's seen a sensible thing to tweak um that's good to know that you've got it to work though and then it, it, it's useful but yeah i think i, I kind of want to be in a uh, in a window running commands ideally same way that line edit does it you know it's yeah. just tweaks right, so, a few more questions yeah, in online. chat yeah all right okay more questions are in chat how did you learn how to program games well originally when i was 11 years old i got a book which I've got on my shelf behind me, um, called uh, Instant Arcade Games for the BBC Micro. And um, I didn't understand all of what it all did. So that's one aspect. Two, I reverse engineered things. Three, I just, you learn to, um, I like, I tend to work out how things work without being shown. So I never got taught DSP. I just looked it up. I understood what was going on um and i kind of figured it out i never got taught play piano either actually so or songwrite or compose i didn't get taught music theory but i can kind of see it if that makes sense so i can look at something that's made and say oh i see they've got a projection there they've got this model this is how i've probably done the ai um and sometimes you you learn things and you find out, oh actually they did this and i, I never knew that so i'm self i've self-taught but i originally picked it up from this little book but that's not the be all and end all of my knowledge i promise um, or the games would look a bit different. Uh, yeah. Reverse engineering in part, I think. What's the other one? Um, apart from the Amiga and Risk OS, what other platforms have you written for? Well, when I was young, I, I did a game on, on Unix at university, which I lost, which was a two-player snake game. That was quite good fun. Um, I was written in Modular 2, I think. And I, with my cousin, I programmed a game on the Spectrum, which is lost. And I had a couple on the Amstrad, which were never released. CBC, just little basic games. Um, but uh, yeah, I also did a game on DOS, which was deleted and probably just as well. And I have an unreleased Windows game, uh, which is not told, not told anyone about. Works Doesn't work on Windows 10, works on Windows 7 and 8. And that's called Solaris. Not great. 
little space invader thing and it is actually on the uh, on um a part of the website i think it might be down it's not listed as a page publicly but i've got a link to it off my twitter feed where i put um an unreleased amiga game which i put up there which was an alpha uh any good game development site sources you know of i want to share Mm. I do a lot of my stuff from scratch. In terms of images, certain things I... One thing I would say for resources, um, if you want to get some nice visual image resources, which are free, rights free, and you know the person that made them, it was Pixabay was quite a good place because some artists put some things up there which you can get. Um, so sound samples, uh, I have got some old Future Music CDs you can get on eBay, and they they cost nothing, and they've got lots of nice sounds on them. Um, if you want to use samples. So that was a, a nice hack. In terms of game development, um, there's always the uh, inevitable stack overflow, I suppose. But I do work a lot of stuff out myself. I don't consult anywhere to go look for algorithms. The AGK, the App Game Kit, have forums where people talk about... I, I did find one thing on there, which is gesture control, which I put my little Sparky game on my mobile phone. And uh, you can drag it to move the character around. So rather than writing gestures, I found someone had done it i'd look at how they've written it because there was no there's no point in reinventing the wheel so there are forums uh app game kits one the graphics on pixabay sound samples you can't get hold of easily for free um unless you go to soundcloud and you have to that's kind of there's the rights you have to be careful about rights issues whenever you make something you have to know the origin of it and um so yeah some stuff on ebay uh, Future Music uh, magazine back in the 90s used to give you CDs on the front colour with sound samples. I've got uh, gunfire, streaming, various random things. And I, I think I can put some of that into the game kit quite safely. Um, so what else have we got? Uh, Gallagher clone. I was thinking of putting something like that into the um, into the uh, game kit as a freebie. Um, I was thinking maybe of doing the time limited Space Invaders that I had time run yeah i could do that gallagher clone i would like to do that'd be fun um outrun i was leaving that to daryl because he wanted to do it i think and i didn't want to to uh to, to duplicate what he was doing uh my young daughter said claire's daddy's computer can play battleships uh. <laughs> yeah battleships you know it's quite fun um, what sort of speed improvements do you think Riskus would get from a proper 2D, 3D graphics driver for modern hardware? Oh, quite a lot. Quite a lot. That's one of the main limiters I have. Because you can get, there, are, there is a graphics driver called Cronus, isn't there, for the Raspberry Pi? Um, and there's, a, there's another one for the RMX6. And it does make a big difference, not having to blitz things around, block image tram for, for, for images around uh, by hand. Um, no, that, that it would it would really help. I have to do various tricks sometimes around it. In Overlord, I was doing incremental drawing. Um, if I ever had a real speed problem, I'd, I'd do that again. Uh, a lot of the time, I, I avoid being too clever to make the code easy to follow to save time. Uh, yes. So yeah, it's, it's something I, I've. Um, uh, I it comes down to what problems I end up with, and then. Um, I think the stuff that Daryl's working on would really help, generally, because I think that covers 2D as well. Because, yeah, the stuff in RiskOS, uh, the basic is really, really fast as, and clever, a lot of the things it can do. Um, but, uh, yeah, the graphics uh, routines aren't as quick as they could be, especially masking really hurts. That's quite painful. So I'm looking forward to, to trying it out and, to, you know, and, and, to, and to help it if I can with, with questions or ideas. Uh, you said you had a car racing game. Is that in development at the moment? Or? Well, no, no, no. I saw, I've got stunt, stunt racers. Which, stunt uh, racer. stunt, yeah. stunt drivers. I, I tried to avoid the name of a, a Risk OS game that was popular. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, because people might be disappointed it's not exactly the same. What was it called again? That's confusing. I've done too many. I'm losing track of what they are. <laughs> um, so, now the game I have in development is, is like um, a sideways scrolling car game. The racing That's game the one. I yeah. had... Uh, it's called what's it called? It's called Stunt Driver. It's Stunt Driver. Stunt Driver. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, that, I, I just saw the screenshot of the sideways scrolling one, but that's uh, on the way. Yes, that, that's right. That one there is yeah. uh, well, it's it's working in prototype form and just trying to make sure it's playable. So that wouldn't yeah. be too long. 
Um, I don't know whether there's going to be any kind of online Southwest show this year. So I suppose we'll right. have to see. But yeah. I might be able to coincide it with that. Okay. I believe Thanks. not. I think um, Andrew said that they're going to put it off so that the Wakefield show can do theirs online without it being too far apart. Fair enough, fair enough. I still might release it anyway, you know, and just, uh, you know, so we, we still get new software. Tony, on the on the sound effects, I came across a site called freespecialeffects.co.uk, which is pretty good. It's got hundreds of special effects and they're supposed to be free, but I, I don't know. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? I mean, I came across one I found like it was hard to get a hold of when I did Legends of Magic. It was a, it was a, a free sound effects sign. It got taken down a couple of times, but it just seemed to be completely legitimate. I looked at the origin of where things had come from. So in Legends of Magic, there's this guy, when you hit the, the main character, he goes, oh, ow, that's not me, fortunately. <laughs> so someone in Germany uh, was doing those effects very effectively. Um, so uh, I, I used that. Um, it's but, still there after three months. So. No, that's, that's, that's cool. But it's it's got called hundreds of sound. effects. Um, yeah, I think the catch is normally they're free for personal use, but not for distribution and commercial yeah. products. That's that's the thing. So they, they they it's really lucrative. I mean, I've you know it's something to you can sell for money. <laughs> that kind well, of well, I've I've retired now and I have some synthesizers and a voice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> An object and a mic. There you go. That's right. Yeah, and I've got harmonizers and stuff like that to do yeah. vogons and what have you. So go for it. Yeah. I mean, there are people <laughs> selling these 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 uh, yeah sample CDs for like you know ten or twenty pounds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Music sounds like CDs as well for for people doing. You know, music production. Mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'd like to, uh, you know, promote the risk cost side of the world. But if anyone wants to uh, send me stuff, just go through the uh, rock club, it's Peter Richmond, and uh, say what you want, and we'll uh, give me something to do in my retirement. You see, that's it. <laughs> so, Makes sense. I'm happy to do that sort of stuff. It's good fun. Mm. That's how I do a lot of synthesized stuff. I quite, quite like doing things with RDSP because you get things that maybe don't have to exist anywhere else because it has a slightly different signal path. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, well, I think I've got uh, most forms of sampling, FM, Casio stuff, uh, Moogs and Oberheims, mm. God knows what. <laughs> That's, that, that Casio stuff, well, they got in trouble for making it because I've got a CZ1000. It's quite a yeah. neat little thing, really, what it does. It's very simple. But it's really yeah. quite cool. Yeah, well, I've got the, the CZ one, which is a touch sensitive one with uh, layering and splitting. And they did a weirder one, the VZ one, which is sort of FM, but not. And you can normally get those for about 300 quid. They're only about 16 voice and have some weirdo things in them. But it actually has an LCD in the middle. So you can actually see a ADSRs or I think okay. there are up to 10 levels you can levels and rates you can change yeah they're quite yeah. long they're quite complicated envelopes on those things yes so yeah. I just no, use, yeah yeah but no filter so you have to sort of imagine the filter by looking at the harmonics and working it all out backwards so that's sort of like fm yeah that so, was uh, the fashion back then it didn't you know didn't really work in terms of its accessibility and friendliness but you know. no no well the, the latest thing that corgan brought out is fm with filters per voice and that makes a bit more sense. It's too bright. Let's dull it down. <laughs> Absolutely. See in the With knobs on as well. That's the real yeah. thing. No knobs. No oh, fun. God. Yeah. Nothing worse. Than, okay. We get down the menus. Keep pressing the yeah, button. That's there right. it is. Yeah. I went past it. <laughs> yeah. I oh. think the favorite phrase they have now is how much menu diving is on your synth? You know, and the answer is more than two levels. I think is probably too too many. I mean, said so that this Casio, I think, had nine on some of the menus. Uh, it's, uh, so it, that you was, need to spend a lot of time. Yeah, that <laughs> was how it was. It was. It's a cost saving exercise. It's cheaper oh, course, to have yeah, less, yeah. less buttons, basically. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But once you understand it, I mean, I've got a mode prodigy at home, and uh, you can almost say make a sound and two minutes later i'll probably have it yeah exactly yeah. okay it's not polyphonic but you know i've got an obheim that's got 10 knobs on that yeah. isn't isn't all of them but you can change anything really quickly you know it's probably got an obheim but you can always multi-track there you go so oh you yes can... yeah yeah that's so, but, but the nice thing is when you layer stuff together you do, i just randomly press patches and go aha right must remember that one <laughs> mm. <laughs> i mean if you just 
change levels up and down to mix between the two of them. Do you? Do I, I take photographs normally if I get a nice sound and I want to have yeah. it. It's the easiest yeah. way than trying to write anything down. Yeah, I'd agree. Because well, I haven't got editors for everything for a start. Uh, but I, I do like to think of something and then try and work out how to do it as well. So, I mean, my, on this Casio VZ1, it's generally very tinkly, but I've made a piano sound out of it, which yeah, you're not yeah. supposed to be able to do. No, it's not a good piano sound, but it is a piano sound. It's know? fun, isn't it? Because I say on the MS, be careful with everybody else, but MS20 Mini, I've, I've got like duophonic playing. I had a way of patching the cables together. Oh, right. And if you yeah. carefully do that, you can trigger two notes. Yes. This is fun. And then the other thing, I don't know how you feel about the Jits, Mr. Levis, but Behringer have got um, uh, a Monopoly coming out. All right. Now, I was thinking of a something that. like, uh, just as an idea, I sort of designed synths in my head and on a piece of paper. One of the things was a four voice poly that isn't. So, two sets of ADSRs and filters, uh-huh. right? So, you could then have two two voice sounds, so like mm. two oscillators or one voice sound if you want to look at it that way. And then you could layer those. So it might be the ultimate mono synth because you can layer two sounds mm. straight away. Or you can have one plus three and have the paraphonic uh, on the three. So you could set a chord up mm. by tuning the oscillators. Mm. And if you get clever, add another button that just retunes one of those oscillators and that gives you a different chord. So normally you're playing majors, press a button, it's a minor. Sure, so you could do that would be quite a cool thing. Yeah, Yeah, but nobody makes one. And this is the no. sort of thing you sort of go, yeah, right. We should go ahead and do one. <laughs> well, there's yeah. this guy, just for one of the questions, I think it appears, I think it's a question of it, but there's a chap in Bedford just down the road from me, and he's telling, like, you know, you get these, these you make very small numbers for handmade synthesizers, his own design, yes. for synth repair. Yeah. I think it's called yeah. synth repair at UK. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, go for it. Just have a go. That's what I say. All the <laughs> chips available. Well, I've drilled some hole, holes into my Moog, uh, so and I've got some holes in the oh, back no. of a Casio. So you know, <laughs> why not? Be done sometimes hacking it, hacking it, don't you? <laughs> Put the drill oh, in. Yeah. Very loud then. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. there's a, never consider compiling BBC Basic or does it does not improve performance for games. It isn't my main bottleneck. I could be, if it depends on how I write the code. I probably write the code so that I don't get uh, a bottleneck on the on on the performance. Uh, partly, but BBC Basic is really fast. The main thing that slows me down are the graphics, for the most part. That's that's what I tend to run into. Um, so as I say, that, that's that's the main thing there. It does make me think. You know, I, a weird thing I, on the synthesizer front, briefly. I, I was having a go at doing fractals and trying to get them to generate sounds because I have synesthesia, so I see colours. I thought, oh, I could just add harmonics together in accordance with fractals. And the end result's a bit weird. I'm not sure if that's actually a pleasing, <laughs> to be honest with you. Is but that not conceptually similar to what NASA have, or, or someone has done with NASA um, images? When was that done? Um, I think I've, I've seen them posted occasionally on Twitter um, where they produce sounds based on the content of the images maybe this was 2012 2009 or something some very very some of them are a bit weird and some of them are actually quite pleasant yeah Yeah. quite possibly i'd have to go look it up this was based on harmonics harmonic transforms but i think fundamentally that there's a flaw in the idea um but i thought it'd be interesting if you could sort of do a fractal zoom to find sounds as a way of you know exploring but it it might be quite non-intuitive and frankly unpleasant (laughs) So I have to look this thing up, Vince. So thanks for highlighting. Um, so I yeah, if I it. see one again, I'll, I'll make a point of uh, at mentioning you when I retweet it or something. Thanks, that'd be cool. Yeah, I think Atari had two different programs where you could put a picture in and get music out, and you decided how much of a picture to use to get the sound that you wanted. So obviously, very variable. You have to spend a lot of time practicing to get what you want. But I think you could do, uh, like you were saying, just choose a section of the picture and that might be your baseline or something like that. So was that a sound or was it music? Uh, that was, uh, yeah, I think that was MIDI notes. Yes, that'd be a relative to a picture. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I wonder if that's what Vince has got. See, I, I thought because it was the synesthesia standpoint, I thought I'd maybe go back the other way. <laughs> like an <laughs> right. image, you get a sound. Um, yeah. Anyway, it hasn't worked so far. <laughs> Brilliantly. Um, um, okay, that's cool. Yeah. I always found that the disco light's a bit disappointing that it's supposed to 
put out colours and beat according to sounds, but I could never see any connection between the colours that come out of my disco lights and the sounds that were going in. No, well, every Fine person is different. Every person is different. Of course, for me, it's like, uh, lower notes come out as red. Some I think, and strings were blue, and you know, various this patterns. Is my, this is my disco lights doing it. I play I some, so disco lights would throb. They get the beat right, but they put colours out which seem to me to have no connection at all to the music. But they don't. I think it's just a little filter, isn't it? A filter and a yeah. gate, and um, it's supposed to rhythmically pulse. But yeah, you could you could do cool stuff with lasers, maybe. <laughs> LEDs. What about LEDs now? You could do cool stuff with that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, effectively, MIDI is nearly DMX, isn't it? So theoretically, you can just swap between the two. Uh, if you give note numbers, colours, or a light, if you have 128 lights to play with, <laughs> you yeah. can have a big yeah. Harris for that one. <laughs> yes, you might. Yeah. You might have a small. Well, LEDs don't cost much to run, fortunately, but uh, years ago, mm. it might have been expensive. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you could if you wanted, you could set the bass range to be a light, and then that light would pulse with your bass notes, wouldn't it? So similar yeah, bass drums, snare, hi hats. It wouldn't be the analog system is limited, as you mm -hmm. say. You can do a lot if you just describe the the, uh, the notes. Yeah, making me think of uh, was it preachers of the third kind or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> yeah so there we are. Slightly more elaborate version of that. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but I think uh, yeah, you could do direct tracks and give the, assign those to a light and then they would pulse with the beat when you've set sensitivity suitably no that could be really good fun I, i'm yeah. i'm very fond of leds yeah yeah mm. well they've got the response as well a, a normal uh what bulb as was would be so mm. slow you'd miss it wouldn't you following the hi-hats or something like that yes it would I think the only I thing you have to watch out for is making sure you don't get epileptic. <laughs> well, that's, I put a, you didn't see it on my game, but I put a warning on there saying this can trigger epileptic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was in the other window. I thought it was quite important to put that in there. Yeah, I think the only other thing I've ever seen was on CDI, and I actually have the disc somewhere. And I can't remember, it was one of the uh, Harris people at the time. I'm trying to remember who it was. It was a duo, I think. And basically, you played around with the joystick and you made up stuff relative to some preset patterns. Uh, mm. So you could waggle your joystick along with the beat. So, so music can be, you know, fairly easy in a way. It doesn't have to be a violin, does it? You oh, know? No. No. You know, it can no. just be a, something fairly interactive. And that's good. Yeah. That's a good thing, yeah. I would say. It's all out there somewhere. <laughs> Well, there's lots of possibilities. And my, my daughter coined this little Japanese, they've got a little mouth and a face and you squeeze them and like a stylus, stylophone. <laughs> it's quite hilarious. Um, they're quite yeah. mad, well, thing, anyway. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. The name of them. They're downstairs at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I think I'm not sure the cat makes them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they're, uh, yeah, it's just, um, you know, it can be, can be accessible. And that's something, this is, you know, fun again, you know, um, it's it's not good when you, you kind of create something and it's inaccessible. That's the nice thing about trackers. They're, they're, they're people I know who use them, they can't play, not really. Yes. But they can make something nice out of those and they come up with some really cool stuff, some, some great stuff, really. Mm. I think the real catch is uh, matching your mind to the machine isn't it uh so i mean like i've never found a hardware sequencer that suits my mind because I, I sort of go well i want a bass and the drums and just loop that forever and i'll tell you when to stop i don't think any of them do that you know well, not in a, a way that makes sense to yeah, me yeah i understand exactly what you mean yeah. about yeah. that yeah no, it's very hard to make them do what you want i mean I was trying to get a, a reggae beat out of a drum machine for the, about two days, I tried. <laughs> Despite reading about where the, where the stress is meant to come and all that, my reggae beat just wasn't reggae. It was just, it was just square, basically. I couldn't get it to swing. Have you tried, um, have you, did you try like playing it and then applying a bit of, a, a bit of tidy up on it, like quantize? Yeah, I tried sort of, I mean, changing the attack and the release and all sorts. I mean, you can make, but it just, it's so much easier on the guitar just to do it. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's why you're fighting, that. you're fighting the instrument. It's, it's producing the analog sound on, on, on digital. It's, it's so difficult. Well, for me, it's difficult anyway. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think, 
I think part of the catch is you have to think like the thing you are trying to play. So, I mean, uh, my favourite one is uh, Jan Hammer playing lead guitar. And he, he can't play guitar very well at all, but he can play a, a Moog fantastically because he, that's what he wanted to learn. And now he can do that's that. true. The instrument has to suit you as a person. And yeah. for a kind of genre of music, you have to understand, well, you have to understand the feel of it. I mean, yes. jamming years ago, doing some funky stuff, you have to catch the, yeah. the vibe, if you know what I mean. Right. And it's, yeah. it's a language, but it's like, a, it's a core idea to it. There's an essence to it maybe a few, yeah. few key parts to it. And some instruments, it just doesn't fit. It's a square peg. You can't get it to go. No, no. I mean, what, what I'm sort of teaching myself in my retirement, I'm not a very good keyboard player. I can play melodies, can play chords, can't play them both together, which is why I have a sequencer. Mm -hmm. But something, uh, I play rhythm guitar, and I'm now sort of teaching myself rhythm keyboard. You try asking a piano teacher to teach you that. They can't, because they, don't, they can't play it. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to be as good as Jules Holland, but I've been a rhythm guitarist. I want to play an equivalent on keyboard. So you need staccato sounds and particular things. That, what you say, cling, cling jazz, but the Stan Freeberg song, cling, 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 cling. It was just playing the chords. <laughs> I know you mean. Play up the keyboard. Um, was, it, was it Jerry, someone? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, but no, yeah, I, I know what I you mean. mean 1950s, you know, the up on the top of the yeah. keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah another one. You Jerry Lee Lewis. Cling, cling, cling. That's Jerry Lewis. I thought it was Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis. I was missing one. Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Part of it. Yeah. I mean, if you if you watch uh, Jules Holland playing Boogie Woogie, that will be the ultimate. Uh, but mine sort of like changing the chords within the rhythm, which is what I would do on the guitar. You see, it's yeah. not in the music. So I wasn't, because yeah. I'm self-taught, but I play play by ear, because that tends to be me what's natural to me. Yeah. I know that some, some bits are picked up on the theory and I can look at something and work it out. But that's, that thing which you and I are talking about there is different to how someone would teach from a book. Because they're, oh, yeah. following a trans, they're transcribing a written form in, in, into a performance. But all yeah. the things you've described aren't really there. There's a few descriptive words on the page and a few symbols. But it, yeah. it doesn't really tell you what it is. That's yeah. that's something which is almost like if you look at what they do in the uh, you know the Indian sort of uh, tabla tradition, where you learn a taught and it's described verbally, you know, yeah. and that sort of thing. That is that is that is codified as a music is really a um, an oral language. It's not it's not yeah. written. It's not for writing down. <laughs> I'd argue. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I've managed to play sort of like uh, funk guitar. And a lot of it is not playing any notes at all. A lot mm. of it is the chaka chaka chak of yep, the rhythm. Yeah. And then you there did, are some chords in between for a fraction of time. And it's when I was trying to explain this to somebody else and said, well, I sort of play this chord forwards. And then as I'm going backwards, pull a few fingers off, then mute it with the left hand and the right hand. But I've all done that in the time of ka -ching. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Exactly. So yeah. can you please write that down? You know, so, <laughs> no. <laughs> Watch this. No. Have a listen. Yes, I can play it slower, but you have to play it at the speed to do it. It's a bit like playing thumb slap bass for funk, mm. which yeah, I nice. could play. It took me about a year. I went, mean, I am never going to get this. And one day I went, ah, oh, it's that. Right. Go I'm ahead. Envious of Mark yeah. King here because he seemed to do it without saying, oh, it's not hard. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it plays at 120 beats per minute and sings yeah. at 30. You know, yes. that's the bit that beats me. One yeah. or the other, fine. Two together, just showing off. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a drummer at heart. Yeah, so, yeah. commends a mu musician, I think, I call themselves, whereas I'm playing at it. <laughs> Forget him now. I've been doing it for 40 years. So I'm <laughs> past average now, I think. <laughs> We're all good in different ways. We're all good in different ways. And that's the key. Exactly. You know, yeah. based on what we've, yeah. we've learned. As you say, you have to have the feel of it. That's that's the key. You do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing I don't think uh, teachers can easily teach you, uh, particularly not on keyboard. Mm. I a guitar teacher that. might. A keyboard player, probably not. Well, the guitars, they're not very polyphonic, but they're massively expressive instruments and very, very oh, yeah. flexible. Yeah. Yeah. I had classical guitar lessons and I don't think my teacher taught me anything but he made me read the dots and make my own sound from the dots mm -hmm. um, it just kept me at it uh, I was never any really good but I could actually play quite reasonable so um, like Rama or something and just it sounded quite nice in the end but it was just hard <laughs> really, really Classi hard. classical guitar is is quite is pretty hard 
yeah. my, my dad was doing that at one stage. I, I think the catch is you have to learn technique and that just takes time. You can't pick up technique in a week, uh, whereas you might no. be able to read the score in a week. <laughs> you know? No, that's, that's the thing. Te technique. It's your mind as well, how you pick that up. Oh, I mean, oh. if you can listen to stuff and pick it up, you're away, and that's what I do. I that's it. was born too soon, really. I, I think I've got friends who play, learned to play the guitar pretty rapidly from videos, YouTube videos. Yes. And I found it is very much better than in my formal guitar teacher, even on a one to one. Well, I used to watch Mark Knopfler playing because I like how he does it. And my brother used to have guitar lessons. I used to crib by watching what, the, what they were doing a little bit. But Mark Knopfler, I, I like how he approaches guitar, but he plays guitar every day you know, and, and enthusiastically. Yeah, this is part of it. I remember uh, saying about Jimi Hendrix that he woke up and put his guitar on and then had his breakfast. That's <laughs> the know, only way not the other it. way around, you know, yeah. and might put it yeah, down just before he went to bed. Priorities, right? You have to yeah, your priorities, right. Yeah. You have to sleep with it and it's in your hand when you wake up and it's in your hand when you go to bed and you'll get your hand on it overnight. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Well, That's I, really good. I, I did that for a while and I was okay for a while, but as soon as you stop doing it, it goes. That that depends, I suppose. Yeah. It depends where you've got up to. I think you have to get yeah. past a certain point. I mean, it's a bit like riding a bike. You will remember yes. it. It'll take exactly. you just a, a while to get back to it. I'm a, I commit certain songs to memory and lyric, and it's fun because you then don't have to worry what your hands are doing. I had a conversation yeah. with someone, and, hey, you know, and <laughs> just yeah. turn away, and I don't know what my hands are doing. They just know they're doing their own thing. You know, That's right. it's, like, it's, it's, really it's an age thing. My, it's arthritis. It really wrecks your guitar playing. Mm. I mean, uh, learn how to play steel, steel slide is the answer. I can't bend tune your guitar. This more than that. That's maximum. I can't can't actually touch my palm with my fingertips. No, and that really wrecks the guitar. Um, uh, open tunings and slide guitar. Yeah, I just, I'll that's keep you busy for another thirty years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's good advice. <laughs> and that's enough guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think we'd get a music lesson as part of the. Sorry. Yeah. For someone who well, had no, I haven't really. I've only had like a year of violin, but quite a lot of vocal training. So, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Well, well, as we've drifted off topic, I think I probably ought to say thank you very much to Tony for yeah. talk, coming to talk awesome. to us. My pleasure. Coming, yeah, we we'll say <laughs> joining us. To talk. And uh, yeah, so thank you for that um, last minute filling in, Tony. It was excellent. Welcome. And. Uh, Yes, yeah. I guess we'll open it up to, well, I was going to say open it up to general chat, but we've already done that really, haven't we?